Thank you, Brad, and uh, thank you all for, for hanging in there. You know, when I was looking at the schedule and noticing that we were coming after the closing plenary session, I said, uh-oh. Um, but uh, so it's great to see you all there. And, um, you know, one of the things I was struck by coming to Canada, and this shouldn't be, uh, it certainly wasn't a surprise after watching you beat us in the gold medal game. Um, <laughs> how, how much, um, you know, hockey is a, is a central part of the fabric of Canada, and, and, you know, this conference is about making the clean energy future a central part of, of the future economy. And so I thought, well, you know, I can't quite speak to the hockey aspect, but in the U.S., the national pastime is baseball. So throw out a little bit of a baseball analogy. I'm the fourth up, which means I'm cleanup. Normally, you'd, you'd, the cleanup hitter has to be able to, uh, you know, really hit well because the other guy's on base, you want to bring him home. Well, we've had three home runs already, so the bases are clear. My objective is just to, to get on base, just to get a first, for, uh, a first base hit. So, you know, with that, you know, very quickly, the Natural Resources Defense Council, we're a national nonprofit. We're U.S.-based. We have offices um, uh, in, I, I'm based in New York. We have an office in D.C., um, San Francisco, Santa Monica, Chicago, uh, and uh, an office in Beijing as well. So our focus, we're a group of scientists, lawyers, policy analysts, environmental specialists, and it's, you know, it's, it's towards uh, environmental uh, pr protection of our natural resources for future um, uh, generations, of course. And of our strategic, strategic priorities, the, the top two are curbing global warming and creating a clean energy future. And so, you know, that's, I want to talk a little bit about how does the plug-in vehicle fit into those, those priorities. So taking a look at this first chart, it's, um, when you first look at it, it could be a little daunting if you realize that this is just light-duty vehicles. What is the uh, business-as-usual trajectory of what emissions could be? And you see that at the top of that blue, it could have been scaling up at quite a rate and basically the wrong direction, right? Where we want to end up is at the bottom of that gray section, which if light duty vehicles, which there's a huge potential for greenhouse gas reductions, is going to do its fair share to meet our global uh, goals of 450 ppm uh, climate stability targets, then you know we need 80% reduction. So uh, as you've heard in other panels today, uh, obviously there's no silver bullet for how we're going to meet this challenge, uh, that blue, uh, wedge there represents uh, vehicle efficiency and it, it, it gets to an 80 miles per gallon equivalent target. Now, my apologies for not converting that to uh, liters per kilometer, um, but basically a way to think about that is a tripling of our fuel efficiency uh, be between now and 2050. Now, can we do that? Well, we've actually already seen vehicles, internal combustion engine vehicles that have hit that target and under President Clinton, there was the Partnership for a New Generation Vehicle Program, and GM produced something called a Precept, which was an 80 MPG uh, diesel hybrid. So a lot of lightweight materials. It was a hybrid, but no plug. The other pieces of the puzzle when we talk about sort of the three stools for getting uh, as solutions to our climate problem um, in transportation, VMT reduction is a, is in a very important piece, and then the low carbon fuels piece is where electricity, advanced biofuels, and other low carbon fuels can fit in. Now, I, I want to reemphasize something that Savag just said, and that is when you have a real big problem, or you have a, actually, when you have three big problems, you don't want to solve them one after the other after the other. And I would add to that, you don't want to try to solve one that makes another one worse. So fortunately, we, we have solutions, clean energy solutions for transportation that deal with the three big problems of one, global warming, two, the use of oil, and three, local air quality. And um, you know, from an oil perspective, the solutions that we looked at to create this graph, um, it, in the Obama administration, when, it, when they were campaigning, they said, you know, in 10 years, we want to uh, reduce our imports by the equivalent of what we import today from the Middle East and Venezuela. And, we, and that was about 3.6 million barrels per day. Well, we looked at a series of measures like these and 
across the transportation sector uh, where our oil is used, and uh, we got to 4 million barrels per day. So we, we can absolutely do it, and we need to do it um, you know, in a way that's reducing our greenhouse gas uh, pollution at the same time as we're reducing our oil consumption. So that means moving to cleaner uh, alternative fuels. As, as Brad mentioned, we took, whoop, we took a look. Aha. Uh -huh. Thanks. We took a look at the roles that plug-in vehicles could take by partnering with uh, Electric Power Research Institute in this study. And this is actually the study was done, it was completed back in 2007, and we're, we're talking with the same folks to, to take another look at this and expand it out um, from uh, sort of typical on-road vehicles to vehicles that are, are used in off-road so uh, applications and other sources of electrification. There's two volumes to this report. One, we looked at greenhouse gases, and the other, we looked at air quality. And I'm just going to walk through very quickly some of the results. And just from a, a, a methodology perspective, what we looked at was large-scale um, implementation of hybrids, uh, uh, plug-in hybrids, um, in an in a actually very aggressive timeline. Uh, and uh, then we looked at the carbon content of the grid, go, carbon intensity of the grid uh, getting cleaner over time. So we basically factored in a carbon policy because that's what we felt like what the future was going to be. So if you look right in the middle there, that 468, that's kind of the, the middle scenario. Um, that's a modest reduction in our uh, carbon intensity of the grill, grid. And you're, you know, 2050, in this scenario, you had about 60% of the vehicles on the road being plug-in hybrids. And that's a combination of plug-in hybrids with uh, an electric range. Most of them had a 40-mile electric range, some 20 and some 10. So that, that kind of reduction was a, is equivalent to taking about 82 uh, million vehicles off the road. You know, that's roughly taking a third of our light duty vehicles off the road today. And of course, there's a large uh, oil benefit from that as well. But if we clean up the grid further, and, it, and you know, there, this is all about a parallel path, right? This is about uh, getting electrified vehicles on the road at the same time that you are cleaning up the grid. So consistent with what um, uh, Constantine was talking about, where we are today, uh, and, you know, we have uh, electric vehicles certainly provide a benefit uh, can, uh, in context uh, from greenhouse gas perspective versus conventional vehicles on the road. We can make sure that that benefit grows and we're getting bigger and bigger benefits even versus uh, efficient hybrids if we clean up the grid. We, we absolutely have to do that. If we're going to meet the global warming challenge that's before us, we have to have a clean grid as well. I mean, that, you know, between transportation and the electric sector, that's two-thirds of the global warming pollution that, that uh, we produce in the U.S. As I mentioned, the, the report was in two volumes. So the second volume dealt with air quality. And, uh, you know, one of the, the benefits that comes from this is that in the U.S., the regulations say that power plant uh, nitrous oxide uh, and sulfur dioxide pollution is capped. That means if you have to produce more electricity to serve an electric vehicle fleet, well, you can't increase those pollutants. But at the same time, by moving to uh, plug-in electric vehicles, you're reducing emissions of NOx and VOCs. So that means that you are seeing an ozone reduction, particularly in large concentrations of these vehicles in urban areas. And so those greenish areas that you see on the graphic, those are all areas where we have uh, you know, significant ozone reduction. Now, there's a similar story with uh, particulate matter, which is obviously a very uh, important health concern. And that's a, a case where uh, you have, again, the precur precursors to uh, particulate matter, like NOx, coming down from the vehicles uh, that help overall lower what's called secondary uh, particulate matter. Now, at the same time, you, you could be increasing, and in our study, we didn't, uh, for the air quality portion, we didn't factor in a cleaner grid over time. So if you were to pump up greater use of coal technologies, then you could have localized impacts of particulate matter. And you have to be, you have to make sure that that is not the case. We don't feel like, we, we feel strongly that no populations should have, uh, be um, exposed to, to larger concentrations of pollutions as a result of, uh, you know, the, even though as a national basis we're getting a benefit. 
I want to just quickly run through uh, some federal policies in the U.S. that are helping to drive forth uh, electrification. It, next week, we're expecting next week that the, what's called the national program in the U.S., which is the first ever greenhouse gas tailpipe standards um, going through model year 2016, along with revamped CAFE standards or corporate average fuel economy standards, those are going to be coming out next, uh, next week, uh, the final versions. And those get you to roughly 35 miles per gallon uh, in 20, model year 2016. So those need to keep on increasing. There's already an incentive for the automakers to make electric vehicles to help comply with that standard because electric vehicles are so much cleaner. That, you know, it, it's an average standard. So if they make an electric vehicle, then that really helps their average quite a lot. If you were in our, our uh, one of the auto uh, panels yesterday, the representative from Toyota said, you know, what they need are performance-based, non-tech, you know, technology-neutral performance-based standards, and they need incentives. Well, <clears throat> I just talked about the performance standards. The second one, why the reason I bring up the the federal clean energy and climate bills in in the Congress, while the House of Representatives has passed the bill, as you all know, and the Senate is in their deliberation stages. What those provide is uh, a huge amount of funding and incentives uh, to keep making these vehicles. And I'll, I'll go into a little more detail there. Finally, cleaning up the fuels, we can follow the same process, and that is putting in place a low carbon fuel standard. And uh, British Columbia has a policy like that. We tried to get one nationally in the US right now, where we have, we have one in California. But we need, to, we need to push that out nationally, and I'll talk very quickly about what, what that means. So when I talk about the incentives in the climate bills, we're talking about over $24 billion that could potentially go to the auto industry just for um, retooling so that uh, they can make cleaner vehicles. And there's a big chunk of that that goes directly to plug-in vehicle manufacturing and uh, also to deployment programs. Just very quickly on what the low carbon fuel standard is, and, and analogous to you know sort of tailpipe standards on the vehicles, the low carbon fuel standard is a performance standard, technology neutral, for the fuel supply. And what it says is, in, in the case of California, by 2020, the fuel, the carbon intensity, meaning the the grams of carbon per megajoule of fuel sold, has to go down by 10 percent by 2020. So. Um, it looks at all the fuels, and we currently have what's called a renewable fuel standard in the U.S. That's a very much a, just a biofuels volumetric standard. But the advantage of a program like this, technology neutral, it brings in electricity. And if you heard one of the previous panels, um, the, the fact that an LCFS exists here in British Columbia is driving uh, quite an awareness in BC Hydro to take a look at there's the potential for huge credits to be earned. Those credits under the low carbon fuel standard for electric vehicles uh, or electricity as a fuel could uh, be passed on to consumers and do a lot to, to uh, help put the infrastructure in place. So just to tie it up, plug-in vehicles are an essential component of a clean energy strategy to get us off oil and to solve our global uh, climate problem. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of things that the utility commissions can do to help speed this process along. And also federal policy can be a great driver. Thank you very much.